You know what? I got those pictures up on the site, and every time I write something new, I have to erase one. <laughs> so I've been taking the pictures that way. People want to look at the board, but there's a lot of information there. Father, in Jesus' name, I come before you, Lord God. I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to break bread and to preach your word, Father God, to teach your word, Father God. I thank you, Father, if we're willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the land, Father God. We'll, we'll partake of you, Father God. We'll partake of your ways, Father. Well, we have to do it your way, Father. As it is written, Father, the children of Israel knew your acts, but Moses knew your ways. Hallelujah. And we understand your ways, Father, because we, we spend time in your presence, O oh God. In your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And we desire to do your work, your way, Father God. The will, the word, the work, the way. Amen. We want to do things, Father God, by the order that you've set in your word, Father. And thank you, Lord, for the teachers and those that come in the name of the Lord, Father, that are willing to do it, Father God, regardless of what all the systems and all the, the organizations and the way they're doing it. Thank you, Lord, for this time with Brother James, Father. And I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Ghost that reveals and quickens to us the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh. All right, so I'm really excited today because we're going to get into something that, once again, there's a lot of um, misunderstandings about how to operate in the faith of God. And... Uh, this is the second foundational principle found in Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through 3. Let me quote that again. It says that, I'm going to start with Hebrews 5, 12. Because they didn't write in, in chapters and verses. It was all one big letter. So it says, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, number one, faith toward God, number two, of the doctrine of baptisms, number three, of the laying on of hands, number four, and of the resurrection of the dead, number five, and of eternal judgment, number six. And this will we do if God permit. So we see here that clearly the Word of God lays out six principles, six areas of understanding that every believer that's born again needs to go through. They need to understand these things. And uh, as I've already stated, you know, the repentance from dead works is one of the toughest ones because we need to understand that we have to get out of that state of mind where we need to be doing something for God and first get trained and taught in the ways of God. I was meditating on this scripture in John chapter 2. And this is Jesus. It says, I'll, I'll read verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any man should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You see, the number one strength of the soul is self-preservation. When when we get confronted, or when you confront your children, or when you confront someone, what are, what is the first thing they're doing? They're throwing up, as Adam and Eve did, the fig leaves and aprons. They're they're doing something to cover themselves. They're justifying what they did, etc., etc. And and because of that, Jesus, he was a man that walked in the spirit. He knew both sides. He knew when you were coming at him with your own motives and when you with your own purpose for your own selfish gain. And he knew those who were sincere and were willing to follow him regardless of what the cost was. And by the way, that is one of the qualifications of discipleship is that you must, as it says up here, these are some that I've been typing out as I take it off the board. 
But in the the disqualifications of discipleship, if anything or anyone becomes first before God, that's the order of first things. If he does not prefer his own life, if he prefers, if he does prefer his own life, in other words, self-love, he cannot be my disciple. If he does not bear his own cross, not Jesus' cross, he cannot be my disciple. If he does not follow Jesus, lordship and submission, you can't be my disciple. If he does not count the cost, he cannot be my disciple. If he does not forsake all, he cannot be my disciple. And if he does not continue in the word, live in the word, he cannot be my disciple. If he does not love one another, selfish and giving and sharing and giving of, giving of his own time, etc., he cannot be my disciple. And if he does not bear fruit, he must, we must have out of the vine. We can't be a disciple. So, Jesus knew that unless I get you, unless you come to me with your whole heart and you allow yourself to be trained and taught the ways of God and the kingdom of God, then I don't have a place for you. And what's interesting is that <clears throat> Jesus only talked about the church three times in the Gospels. And he said, I will build my church, right? And the gates of hell won't prevail. So when we look at our current situation and we look at our world and we look at the body of Christ, and we look at our communities, and we look at all these places that are without God. Did Jesus build that? You see, I will build my church, he said, and the gates of hell won't prevail. In other words, we're going to be the ones that bind and loose. When you come under the authority of Jesus Christ, and you finally realize this kingdom of God is not about a system and about organized religion, but it's about a king named Jesus Christ, who came into the earth, and he was God. And he preached to us and told us the kingdom of God is not without, it's within. I have to rule your heart, says the Lord, in other words. And until I do that, you know, you're just, you're just mentally assenting in your life, and you're not understanding that, that I've got a purpose. Can you imagine coming to that place? You know, one of the names of God is Jehovah Shabbat, which means the Lord of hosts. Can you imagine a unit as Jesus prayed in John 17 that they might be one, right? A unit that's moving as Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Whenever there's a prayer need or anything that comes up, we start binding and loosening as a unit and we start doing the war in the, in the heavenlies, in other words, in the spiritual realm. Because it's not about flesh and blood, right? It's about principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. This is part of walking in the kingdom of God is you're going to have to go out and slay some devils. Amen? For him, he's given us authority to do that. He said, I give unto you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. And of course, if you think about it, there's all these systems out there, these organized religions, that that's what they rejoice in. They rejoice that they have the ability and the power to pray for people and to cast out devils. And that's where they stop. You see, number three, the doctrine of baptisms, that one is called baptism into the cloud. That's the, the whole purpose of that is you have to be moving with God, going from glory to glory, not locking down saying, this is it. Hey, y'all, y'all need to do it like we are. It needs to be a continual flow going forth. And, that, and, and that's what that's talking about. And many, people, many organizations stop you see, and, 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 and as a result of that, if you think about the life of God there, it's, it's no longer there because you choked out. You said, this is it. You limited me, in other words, the Lord is saying. And so anyway, um, those are the issues, you know, those are some of the things that we have to deal with as a body of Christ. And like he said, I will build my church. And by the way, the word church is ecclesia. If you look, there's one instance in, in uh, Acts where they met, the Ecclesia met, because they were having a problem with Paul and Barnabas. They cast out some devils out of, out of some individuals, and now their, their means of business had suffered. So they took Paul to the Ecclesia. It's, it, what it is, is, see, in other words, this is the government of God. This is me in the earth through my people. We are the ambassadors. We are the ones that are reconciling the world unto God. 
And but there comes times where we have to meet and we have to there should be a purpose for coming together. It shouldn't just be for me to get filled up. <laughs> you see? But it should be so that we can understand more of what the needs are in the body of Christ and we can begin to pray for those individuals, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And if God wants, you know, God chooses by the Holy Spirit that there's ministry of the Spirit that needs to take place, well then we do that, you know, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But again, there should always be a purpose for coming together. All right. Let's go ahead and get into our, our our text here, which is, this is the second of the foundational principles, faith toward God. And that right there is a revelation in itself because it's not faith in what I believe towards. You know, like for example, you got a couple that's having a baby and the husband might say, well, we're going to have a boy, right? But he has no scripture on it, no word on it. So what is he doing? He's mentally assenting. He's trying to bring something to existence by believing it. That's not how faith works. It's faith toward God, faith toward God's word. And the thing about this is that that's dangerous because there's nothing getting changed in your life. You're mentally assenting to the things of God. You believe. Yeah, I believe the word, but the word's not in your heart. What should we be preaching? As he says, uh, verse 9, Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe, shall believe in thine heart the God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. In other words, there's a process there. And we're going to get into that, but the point I'm trying to make is that that's what we need to be proclaiming is the Word of God. And uh, so let, let's start by reading Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. So, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, this is real. I mean, this is so enlightening, this whole piece right here. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So, they talking about Israel, but let's look at us talking about the body of Christ. And those members that, are, that we know that are a part of our lives. They have a zeal of God, but they don't have knowledge. You see? Therefore, because they don't have knowledge, there's a statement down there in the corner on the left that says, a man's confession is a result of his believing. A man's believing is a result of his thinking. And a man's thinking is a result of his knowledge. And there's only two sources, God or the devil. It's on the bottom left. You see, so if they don't have knowledge of God and the ways of God, then that means their confession, what they're saying, which is what's going to be a part of their lives, which is not going to be God because they're not getting it from the Word, you see. Therefore, uh, they're not going to get anywhere with God. Now, verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness... Again, he's talking about Israel, but I'm talking about the body of Christ. And going about to establish their own righteousness, have not them submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So part of the repentance from dead works is that you've got to, you've got to turn from, from the dead works and turn to the righteousness which of God, which is Christ. You see, as he says in Isaiah 54, in righteousness thou shalt be established. You see, it's in righteousness that you get established. Your mind has to change in its process of thinking, regardless of what comes at you. You know, your your the people that are close to you might tell you that, oh, look what you're doing, look what you're doing. You know, they start pointing the finger at you. But you have to come back and say, wait a minute, I'm the righteousness of God. If you let that condemnation get you and tear you down, then you're putting yourself back in chains, back in prison, if you will. And we've got to break free from that and understand that we are the righteousness of God. So they were ignorant of God's righteousness. That's the same situation that we're all to, we are in today in the body of Christ. They go about to establish their own righteousness with dead works. And they don't submit to the, themselves to the work that Jesus Christ has already done. And, and therefore, they're constantly mentally assenting and, and there's no fruit that's being bore in their lives. Verse four, for Christ is the end of the law of end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that a man which doeth those things shall live by them. In other words, you know, God shall not be mocked. Whatever man sows, that's that's what he's going to reap. So if you're always sowing, 
and, and being involved in dead works, well, then there's no fruit going to be produced. Right? Okay. In verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now I want you to look down into the, uh, where I have G3004. And the word speaketh is the Greek word lego. L-E-G-O. And lego means, if you look at the strongs down towards the bottom, a primary verb properly to lay forth, that is to relate in words, usually of a systematic or set discourse. Amen? So that... So that the righteousness which is of faith speaketh. That tells us right there there's a revelation there that, that we have to lay forth the word of God in a certain course. It can't just be all rambling stuff. Knowledge that, that, is not, that God is not breathing on. The word by itself can't do nothing by sitting up there on the mantle of somebody's fireplace or on the coffee table. It's got to get in your heart as, it says, as we go on down to understand it. We confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts. It's got to be a process that we begin to understand how to lay forth this word. A master, master, uh, I say skillful in the word of righteousness. There's a process to God and how he operates. And we can discover that process by getting involved in his word and by being taught the kingdom of God and the ways of God. Um, so, and then I like the word wise because... If you look on down, it just says, again, in this manner. So, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. There's a certain manner, there's a certain format that we should be following in the process of the kingdom of God and how we're bringing forth the faith of God, the word of God, etc. Faith towards God. So then he says, um, Say not in thine heart, so there again, there's another principle there that if you're saying in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, verse 7, or who shall ascend into the deep, that is Christ, bring Christ up again from the dead, that's, that work is already being done. It's not something that we need to be, um, as a believer, focusing on. In other words, we're the ones that have the word of faith in the earth. We're the, we're the just, and the just shall live by faith. It's not Jesus... In other words, he's not going to be standing right here doing it for you. You've got to step out and you've got to put the word. You've got to lay it forth. If you get up in the morning, you start laying forth. Okay, so gosh, it's so hot. Man, I know it's going to be a tough day today. Here we go. You're laying forth your world for that day. But glory to God, if you get up and you start proclaiming the things of God and you start letting it go forth out of your lips, amen, you're starting to lay forth for your day. And it's the same thing in, in all of our lives. So it says, verse 8, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. And the word, word, is the Greek word rhema. So we, we know that there's two words for word, right? Rhema and logos. Logos is the written word. Rhema is the spoken word. In other words, Again, when he breathes on that word and you're sitting there and you're, 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 you're praying or, or you're looking at a verse and all of a sudden it gets quickened to your spirit, right? That's the rhema right there. That's the debar, God, speaking into your spirit, which is debir, the holy of holies. And now you can come forth with something from the Lord, not mentally assent because you know the knowledge of it. There's a big difference. Jesus in John chapter 3, that which is of the flesh is flesh. That which is of the spirit is spirit. When it comes forth out of the spirit, it has life on it. So, um, we know what the word faith, well, we may not know, but I'm going to read it here. It's, it's the Greek word 4102 in the strong. And it means a conviction of truth, of anything. So, that tells us right there that a conviction of truth of anything tells us that it can be faith in, in the world, in other words, because of the knowledge that they're bringing you. And, and down in the Strongs it says a moral conviction of religious truth or the truthfulness of God or a religious teacher. In other words, it's the faith, obviously we know that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. 
And we also know that without faith, it's impossible to please him. And there's an understanding in, in that that needs to be the God kind of faith, as Jesus told, I, don't, I think it's in Matthew, I don't remember. But, so it wasn't about the amount of faith, like the grain of a mustard seed, right? It was the kind of faith. Not mental assent, but faith towards God, the Word. In verse 10, I mean verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And we know that, that, that the work that Christ has done is an eternal work, right? And we also know that there's many times when we, we need help, we need to get out of something. So, is he gonna is he gonna not help us because he's already he's already done the work? No, he's gonna continue. But as he says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, it's a it's a, it's everything that we're needing in our lives and everything that we're believing for towards the body of Christ and towards all the areas of ministry that God has involved in. It's gonna take confession with your mouth and believing in your heart. Amen. And the word confess, very, very uh, enlightening word. Uh, in the second page, it's the Greek word homologia. And the two words, it says to assent, that is to covenant. And it means, and the Thayer describes it as to say the same thing as another, to agree with, to assent, in other words, to concede, not to refuse, not to deny. But to confess, to declare, to confess, to admit, or declare one's uh, self-guiltiness if necessary. But but we've always thought about that I need to be telling somebody what I've done, you know, because of the traditional thinking of the Roman system and what they brought forth. But the word confess is homologia, which means to speak the same as the word. Speak the word. In other words, faith cometh by hearing. As we're in prayer, praise God, and we're confessing the word by quoting those scriptures as we're praying, etc. You're hearing that. And what's happening? Your faith is getting built up. And that's what's going to change people's lives is faith towards God. In other words, them hearing the word and believing the word of God. Not, not you know, I mean, you know, these guys out there, these multi- mega televangelist guys that they get them in public and they, they they want to declare that they're going to believe God for a jet or something. I mean, first of all, I would not be exposing myself if that was what I was trusting, but I would have to have the word of God from that, not just a mentally assent that we're going to believe God to raise enough money to build a new building. What word did you get on that? It's faith toward God. Whew, man. Verse 10, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness. In other words, the work that Jesus Christ has already done, that's how you believe unto it. And with the confession, the mouth is made unto salvation. So it's unto righteousness, and then confession is again the word homologia, unto salvation. It's a constant, constant bringing forth the word of God on the matters that we're dealing with in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So, as he says, uh, verse 11, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And the word rich there is the word um, to be rich, to have abundance of outward possessions, wealthy. So, you know, we know that God wants to bring wants to cause us to be prosperous but we also know that the presence of God is also very precious amen and that's the richness that I desire because I know that by the wisdom of God he'll lead me into those things that he has for us but but it's again it's not chasing after the the lust of the flesh the pride of life what does it say enter and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, it's the one of the great words for, uh, let's see, how does it say? The wisdom of this world is first pure. 
I have to go back and think about that one. But it's the word bios, and it means livelihood. It's not about chasing livelihood. It's about chasing God, which again, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and, and all these things will be added unto you. Everything that the world's looking for, we don't have to stress out about it, in other words. And I've heard that taught some crazy ways. That, that doesn't mean God doesn't want you to uh, not be responsible, which is true. But to the point that the primary should always be to seek first God. Seek you first, in other words. And uh, anyway, so let's move on here. Now, uh, uh, for the word homologia, I did put all these reference scriptures there. And if you look at that and start thinking in the light of to speak the same as the word, it's very, very enlightening. Um, now, we're going to go into Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 6. What time is it? Oh, we got time. You got any questions, brother? No, it's going good. <laughs> One thing about the Word of God, really with any teaching, any anything, whether it's training on how to do something on a computer or whatever, it always comes on three stages. Revelation, transfiguration, manifestation. Another way to say it is 30, 60, and 100. The blade, the ear, the full corn, the good, the acceptable, and the perfect. But if you give yourself long enough to it, to the word, in other words, in this case, it'll become transfiguration. In other words, it's going to become a part of your life where as you give yourself un to the understanding of it, then before you know it, it becomes a way of life where these are principles and the ways of God that are embedded in your heart and that at any given time, when there's a need for it, it'll rise up and distribute and give to the people. So Deuteronomy 30, and it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord thy God has driven you, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations which the Lord thy God hath scattered. If any of thine be driven out unto the utmost parts of heaven, from thence the Lord thy God will gather them, gather thee, and from thence he will fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which, he, which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the, and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And verse 11, For this commandment which I command you this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. And then verse 12, 14, I'm sorry, no, it's 11 through 14. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us? Which is, remember, Paul just quoted that in Romans 10. Or, who, or bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. Neither it is, it is it beyond the sea that thou shouldst say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. And verse 14, But the word is very nigh thee, nigh unto thee, in thy mouth and in thine heart, that thou mayest do it. And that's the thing, is that the word is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. Just like you quoted in Romans chapter 10. Again, it's the heart and the confession comes should be the word of God. And whatever's in your heart, by the way, that's what's going to come out. As a man thinketh, so is he, it says in Proverbs. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I was talking to my boys the other day. We, we lay down, we, we talk about the word of God, we're getting ready to go to bed. And I said, Thomas, what's always coming out of your mouth? He had to think about it for a second. He said, well, it's games. <laughs> and same thing with my other son. And then I said, what's always coming out of your daddy's mouth? He goes, well, word of God. So there's the difference right there. Whatever you're giving yourself to, that's what's going to come out. And I, like I said, I use stuff like that as an example to them of where their heart should be. But the point is, is that, you know, whatever you're spending time on, this is what's going to come out of your mouth. Now, there's a little diagram there. we got about 10 minutes here. Jeremiah 15, 1. Then said the Lord unto me, 
Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward these people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. So we understand that there's this place with God where it's death and that there's a place where there's life. Ezekiel 36, 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And, uh, and it is to the point that, again, the Word is what has to clean up our lives. When, you know, when we sit there and try to focus on what's not the precious, which in other words, the problem that we're dealing with or going through in the area where we need deliverance, for example, the, the goal is not to focus on what's not precious. As he told Jeremiah, you separate the precious from the vile. Don't focus on the vile, in other words. You see? And I had to come to that realization here in this in this fellowship, you know. It's so easy to see the carnality of man. You know, the sins of the flesh, in other words. But I had to come back to the Lord. Father, you know, you're going to have to help me. And it's the same message to me, Joseph. You just focus on this, the word, precious. You see? And you let my word, my, the Holy Ghost, sanctify them through the word. And they'll begin to separate themselves because of the Holy Spirit, not because of you, Joseph. In other words, because of God. So Ephesians chapter, chapter 2 is real uh, clear on... Uh, I don't think we're going to read the whole chapter, but... As he says, verse 1, And you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So before we knew the Lord, we were dead in trespasses and sin. And then he says in verse 2, Where in the time past you walked according to the course of this world, the word world is there's cosmos, which means their orderly arrangement and system, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also, again, in time past, we had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But God, praise God, in verse 4, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he has loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, had he quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And the whole point of Ephesians chapter 2 is that you see the contrast of before you were in the Lord, after you were in the Lord. Amen. And and the thing about it is, in John 1.17, and this, is, this talks about the law and grace. 117 for the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ hallelujah yeah. and and see that that is not just a principle of what what we go through as the body of Christ but even ourselves in the way that we operate in the things of God we can bring forth condemnation so fast and so easy but when we mix it with faith amen and we and we bring it forth in the grace of Jesus Christ it has a different spirit on it one of them, as he's getting ready to, we're going to go into 2 Corinthians 3, 9, is that one of them is uh, Moses' administration. The other one was Jesus' administration. So 2 Corinthians 3, 9. For the ministration of condemnation, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more than the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. And right there, that brings a sharp contrast to those that are living by the law. You know, you got your organizations out there that they're saying that you can't eat meat, you can't get married, which First Timothy chapter 4 talks about that those are doctrines of devils. <laughs> and, and it's so funny because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I mean, God told him in the very beginning, be fruitful and multiply. Why would he change that? He set, a, he set a, an ordinance into motion when he said that to Adam and Eve. And he's not going to sit there and change it in midstream and say, I don't want y'all to get married anymore so y'all can't have babies. I mean, sometimes, and again, you know, the body of Christ and those that are out there don't even sit there to think about this stuff, you know. It's so sad. 
You know, I, I take a lot of pictures and I use this as an example to people all the times of birds and stuff and and you're never gonna see a male cardinal pair up with another male cardinal. They only do their function, they only do their role, what they were meant to do, and they came from order. They only know how to follow their course. And yet mankind is, mankinds are the ones that are always transgressing, crossing the line. I mean, what would happen to society if all society was homosexual? There would be no babies. Now they can come up with all their creations of how to figure out how to make all that synthetic. <laughs> Boy, I, I hate to see that, what they would put out. Oh, so again, you got the ministration of condemnation and the ministration of righteousness. And one is a sin consciousness, the other is righteousness consciousness. One brings guilt, the other brings peace. One is condemnation, the other one is justification. And justification is just as if I never did it. Amen. One is the shadow of things to come. One is reality. Shadow was Moses. Reality is Christ. One is the glory. It's fading away. One is we move from glory to glory. And then one is death and the other is life. And, uh, you know, there's so many contrasts like that. There's the tree of life and the tree of the, the, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One of them, you go after this tree. As he told her, you're going to be your own God. We'll get back into dead works because of that. You, 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 you are on top, in other words. And the other one is the tree of life. He said you can go to this tree anytime you want. You know, one of them because they disobeyed God, they uh, they chose their own life. Jesus said, if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you seek to lose your life for my sake, you'll gain it. The word life is the Greek word suke, which means soul. Every time we seek to justify and save our own lives and do it outside of the way of God, he just lost it. But thank God that Jesus Christ, when he went through the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, it took him three hours to bring his soul under control. And, and he told him, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, you know. And the thing about that is that, is that if he hadn't given it up then and brought his soul under control, because he, he said to God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me right and 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 if it be that will you know we use that religiously well if it's God will or heal that's so that's so ignorant because why would he say in his word by his straps you healed if he didn't believe we should all be healed and who's the one that comes to take that it's Satan he's the thief comes to steal kill and destroy God is not out there killing people. God is not, he's not out there causing this. Now, the body of Christ, because they're not in their place, they're allowing it. Because once you have authority, you can bind and loose all this trash. But, but, but if we don't know that as a body of Christ collectively, what part of the purpose is of bringing peace into the earth through Christ? We're not going to see it. But it gets back to the government of God and how things are established in the earth. You know, if you look at the Word of God, God had, from the beginning always had three. Let us make man, Elohim, plurality of the Godhead. All right? And then he said, Moses, Jethro told Moses, when he saw Moses judging the people all day and all night, he said, surely you're going to wear away. In the system where there's only one on one in leadership, that system, you see him burning away all the time. And, and yet we still haven't thought to figure out, well, maybe we're just not doing something right I hear about that all the time. I hear about young pastors and stuff that get burned out, you know. And it's because the government wasn't set up right. Because Jesus said, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There should always be a distribution. There should always be a leadership group. You know, the elders, in other words. There should always be a right and a left hand like, like Moses, Aaron, and Hur. And when they were lifted up, they were able to do something for the Lord. But when they let their hands down... That's when the enemy came back in on them. Principles. What did Jesus do? Peter, James, and John. He took the three where he didn't take the twelve. He took the twelve where he didn't take the seventy and the one twenty. And the five thousand, he told them, I know why you follow me. You want the miracle, the fish, and the loaves. He knew they weren't going to commit to them. And the other groups, they weren't interested because they could pray for people and cast out devils. But the disciples, the twelve, those are the ones that he built the kingdom of God on. And, and the thing is, it only takes a handful. 
Think about that and look where we are today. So, well, it's 10.50. I'm going to try to finish this. So, point number two down there. It says, someday, somehow, some way, somehow, if God, if God, if I could just get God to do something. There's a typo there. So, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but have seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed them, homologia, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So, for them, it was afar off. Uh -huh. But for us, Ephesians 2, back to Ephesians. 13 and verse 17. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off. So all these brothers and sisters that came before Christ, they were afar off. But now they're made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ, and so are we. Now they have that place in God. Verse 17, it says, And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. Hallelujah. They were seeking a country. They were moving towards Zion, that place of God, that place of Calvary. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. And these all of have, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. They obtained good report and they received not the promised. Mm. And then number three, section three, it says it is finished. First John 3, 8, for what it, actually the whole let me see here let me read it as it says it he that committed the sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil and likewise in our lives that's what should be the goal is to destroy the works of the devil everywhere we go glory to god casting them devils out healing the sick making that blind see the ears the, the deaf to hear raising the dead etc whatever is necessary whatever he's calling for agents of god in the earth hebrews 2 4 god also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles dunamis and merits most of the holy ghost according to his own will i'm sorry i read 4 i should read 14. Hebrews 2.14, For then, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself, he also himself likewise took part of the saying that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Amen? And in the present day, the ministry of Jesus Christ is to regather the exiles of Israel. And, you know, I'm not necessarily, I mean, I'm over here on this side of the Gentiles, and for those brothers and sisters out there working with those individuals that are Jewish, man, it's a hard work, man. They need a lot of prayer, too. Verse 1, 1 John 2, 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not, and if any man ha sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And all three of these verses, advocate, intercessor, uh, or actually verse the first two verses that word is is a word where in other words there's a constant courts we're in a court all the time the enemy is constantly accusing the brethren and if we seek to save it then we'll lose it in other words the holy ghost can't represent you in the earth but if you just sit there and and don't say anything when you're getting accused then the holy ghost said well wait the blood of jesus and that's what get presents presented and therefore, the enemy has no place in that situation. Hebrews, so Hebrews 7.25, I think it's the same word, advocate. No, actually, it says intercessor. 
Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints. He's always there to intercede and step in for us. Amen. And Hebrews 10, 13. From henceforth expecting till all his enemies be made his footstool. You know, I was meditating on something that happened at our home and and I was just wondering how did the enemy get in? How did he, how did, who stuck their hand through the heads to get bit? And, and the point is, is that out of that, what came out of that too, is that I, I, someday I'd like to do a play about that, about Hebrews, I mean, 1 Corinthians 11, which is called the Godhead uh, Lordship. Godhead, how it talks about God over Christ, Christ over man, man over woman. And that every woman prayed in her prophesying with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. So who's the head of the woman? The man. And when she steps out from under his authority, she's dishonoring her head. Every time the man prays and prophesies with his head covered, in other words, another covered another than Christ, he's dishonoring his head. You see? And so what happens when we dishonor our head and we bypass authority? It's like opening the door to Satan every time. And not only in our domestic situation, when we're out there in the world and the laws and the rules and things have been set up, the authority structure, in other words. And the enemy knows the word better than us, man. And he knows every time we cross and every time, he, because you basically we're giving him legal, legal precedence to step on in and do havoc. One more verse, Matthew 11, 4 and 6. 4 through 6. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the, dead hear the, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. No. <clears throat> the word offended is the word scandalizo, where we get scandal on. Scandal, in other words. That's the way of the enemy is to accuse and bring scandal against us all the time. But thank God we have an advocate. We have someone that if we won't sit there and defend ourselves, that he'll step up for us. Amen. Our great high priest. Hallelujah, Father, I thank you for this time, Lord God. <coughs> Lord God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for my brother, yes. James, Father. I look forward, Lord God, to your work today in the house, in the fellowship, Father. And we look forward, Father, to the ministry of your spirit, O oh God. Thank you for this day, Father. Thank you for our families, Father. And thank you, Lord, for all the lives, Father, that are touched, Lord, by your gospel. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.